Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Horrifica, the channel for all your horror-related content. I'm your lovely host, Mercy Grimm, and it's time for a special episode, and a new series where I will be talking about a special type of horror that holds a special place in my heart. Get comfy, and put your listening ears on as I tell you a tale about a little girl named Coraline. Fair warning before you get into this video, there are heavy spoilers for the movie in question. So if you've never seen Coraline, then you might want to skip this one. If you don't care, then you've been warned. Also, if you're new to this channel and love horror movies as much as me, then please consider subscribing to this channel and turning on the notification bell. It really helps me out. Now, on to the video. <laughs> Caroline, oh wait, excuse me, Coraline is a beautifully crafted 2009 children's horror movie. It is a claymation masterpiece. And yes, I just said children's horror movie. Okay, it's true that this movie is technically a dark thriller, but if you've ever seen it, which you need to as any horror fan should, then you know that this film wasn't actually meant to be perceived as a horror, but just look at this villain. Look at her. And just take a moment to remember how she kills children. Yes, children. Then after that, tell me this isn't a horror movie. Okay, we're on the same page now? Cool. Coraline is a young girl who moves into a strange house with her overworked mother and father who really don't pay that much attention to her or her happiness. Coraline feels trapped in her loneliness. She feels like her life is too mundane with no excitement and she doesn't truly really have friends to enjoy it with. At the beginning of the movie, it is made very clear that Coraline does not want to be here, so she tries to play games with herself to make her situation more manageable. We understand while watching her that she's a very independent child and capable of taking care of herself, unlike most kids in these types of movies. Coraline isn't entirely about a coming of age story where the child character grows in maturity, but rather where the child character learns to accept the fact that they sometimes just have to grow up like they already are and accept the world that they live in, realizing that if they try hard enough and in the right way, then they can change it for the better. Now that we have the context about Coraline and her personality and her situation down, let's get to the plot and break it down. <laughs> Coraline meets a young boy who is the grandson of the landlady. YB, the boy, gives Coraline a doll that looks strangely like her that he claimed to have found in his grandmother's house. We also meet the scraggly black cat that serves as a silent, at least for now, companion for Coraline that seems bent on following her around as she explores the desolate and monotone environment that is the grounds that surround the apartments of the Pink Palace. It is such a beautifully depressing piece of imagery, showing the bright yellow of Coraline's coat in contrast to the gray tones of the world around her. The movie is trying to show us that she is the light of this world. It is, in a way, foreshadowing that she will be the change to this place. In her exploration of the house, she finds this strange locked door to a crawl space in the living room. To get it unlocked, she goes through some conversations with her mom and finally nabs the key to the mysterious door. Look, guys, if I know anything about horror, I know that you don't go through the strange locked door. You just don't do it. It was locked for a reason. Well, Coraline, being the precocious 11-year-old that she is, paid no attention to that or the strange passageway she crawled through until she found herself in a parallel world. In this place, she meets the woman known as the Other Mother and Other Father as well. They are a carbon copy of her own parents. Uh, the only difference is the buttons that they have for eyes. Coraline is a bit confused, and albeit disturbed by this discovery at first. But these doppelgangers appear to be much nicer, more attentive, and more caring than her actual parents. Something that Coraline desperately craves as a child. Okay, we have to remember that though she is mature for her age, like I stated before, she's still 11. And the only reason why she became so mature at the age of 11 is because she basically had to take care of and entertain herself her entire life due to her workaholic parents neglecting her. 
Let's not skirt around it. What was happening was a form of abuse. Though not intentional on the parents' part, it attributed to this course of events. If her parents had simply spent more time with her, she would not have been so sucked into the other world that she found. She might have never even found it. Because we do find out toward the end of the film that the other mother only goes for children who she can easily manipulate, this is a very important thing to remember. And manipulate Coraline she does. Coraline is seen visiting her three more times through a montage as we learn a bit more about the possible dangers that she could really be in through warnings from other characters. Even YB thinks it's weird. Not only that, but upon her visit to this world, that cat that I mentioned before becomes quite the talkative creature. The cat seems to be the voice of reason, and ironically so, sanity within the world, and the stability that Coraline needs while facing the dangers of that reality. He has great knowledge of the other world and becomes Coraline's traveling companion, and in some instances, protector throughout the film. There are many theories that are actually floating around on the internet about the origins of the mysterious black cat, such as why can he talk while in the other world? Why is he so protective of both Coraline and YB? Why does he have so much knowledge about our villain? And why does he wish her demise so greatly? Theories range from the cat being YB's grandfather to the cat being a double agent for the Bedlam. That's the other mother or the villain of our story. I personally like to think that the cat is a form of familiar to the Bedlam, and he acts as a protector of the children of the building to guide them into making good choices. He's the morally ambiguous but loyal creature of the film. The wise old soul archetype. The guy, basically. Coraline soon figures out that something is not right about this other world. And that happens when the other mother offers her to come stay there forever. By offering her a set of her very own button eyes. Oh boy! Mom, I want some button eyes. That's exactly what I want. You can just scoop out my eyeballs and sew some nice little button ones in there. You know, I want black, but you could also pick your own color, I guess. So maybe I'd want, like, black with specks of yellow because, you know, those are, like, my two favorite colors. <laughs> Here is where our story really takes a turn for the worst and steps into the shoes of a true horror movie. Through a series of events, Coraline must escape this other world because she obviously refused to sew buttons instead of her eyes. She obviously refused that choice, people. She discovers the horrific secret that the other mother has been stealing the souls of children by binding them to her world through the button eyes that she tricks them into wearing. So she's done this before. She's actually done it three times before. She's stolen souls of children. She has the souls of children to keep her young and keep her vibrant and keep her healthy and keep her powerful. She kills children. Tell me that's not a horror movie. This woman only goes after vulnerable children whom she can easily manipulate, as I stated before. Coraline meets these three other children when um, the Bedlam actually traps her in a mirror in the other world for not choosing the eyes because... She didn't choose the eyes because, I, I don't know, probably because she didn't want to put buttons over her eyes. So she has this whole conversation with these three children and finds out about how they got there, what happened to them. And she kind of makes the connection that her situation is a bit similar to theirs with the whole, you know, neglect. And they feel like no one understands them. And then they kind of find this beautiful, perfect other world, and they're like, oh, this is so much better than ours. Of course, I would happily sew buttons into my eyes. This sounds like a great time. After this whole conversation, Coraline is freed by other YB. So other YB is basically um, YB, the carbon copy of YB from the real world that the Bedlam made to make Coraline feel more comfortable in the other world and also to keep an eye on her. But he betrays the Bedlam and sets Coraline free. So she breaks free from this mirror and uh, she promises the other three children that she will free their souls by coming back. So once Coraline returns to the real world, she realizes that her parents are missing her actual real reality. The Bedlam has captured whatever they're called. So she goes around the Pink Palace. There's a couple of 
of really interesting characters in this show that I haven't talked about in this movie that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, there's an older Sergius gentleman and there's a poor it's, it's a whole thing. Um, they are all They are the ones who give her this object to help her out in her quest to get back to her. After she receives this item from her neighbors, she goes to bed. At this point in the story, it's now when we see sleep the cat wakes her up and shows her what the bedlam has done to her parents they are now the ones trapped in the mirror that she was formerly trapped in so the cat suggests to her that she challenge the bedlam to a game to save her parents and the souls of the other children but he warns her that she doesn't play fair so she goes back to the other mother already all gung-ho to fight to duke this out let's duke this out she bargains her own soul in exchange she's like okay if i lose i'll put on those button eyes she now has to use the object that was given to her by those other two strange characters that I don't really like to talk about, especially the fortune told me because she's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> she now has to use that object to find the eyes of the children in the other world before the time, find those other children's eyes before the time runs out. Once she collects all the eyes, she returns to the bedlam, and this is where we now see the bedlam's true form and how horrifying it is. It is the stuff of nightmares. If you are afraid of spiders, look away for a couple seconds. You don't want to see this. Okay, here it is. All right, you can look again. She is informed that even if she does win the bedlam, it won't let her free. Remember, this villain doesn't play fair. The cat did warn her. So Coraline goes for the same approach. And with the cat's help and the help of one of the children, one of the children's souls, she manages to escape the bedlam and set the children free and save her parents. And she locks the door behind her. There's this whole little thing where one of the Bedlam's hands also escapes. And there's like a whole little like chasey thing. And they're like, ah, nah, 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 nah. They still end up locking the door. Because Coraline was successful in finding her parents and all the other children, her parents appear back in the real world with no memory of their time in the other world. And with the help of YB, the actual YB, not the other YB, we're in reality again, people. Coraline dumps the key to the door down the well that's outside. And at the end of the movie, we kind of get this little turnaround of events. Um, through a course of time, the outside world slowly gets decorated, the garden gets filled, things get a little more colorful. Coraline's parents, who are now free of their work for the time being, decide to throw a nice garden party for everyone who lives in the building. And we notice that the world around them seems to have color to it once again. The film ends with the cat disappearing behind the house. Like I said, the whole point of Coraline being the only colorful thing in the story would really tie in at the end. So, to break it down, this movie didn't really have a moral agenda, as most children's movies have moral agendas, which is odd. I would say that the only lesson to be learned is how to appreciate what you already have. Find the light in your darkness and change all that darkness into the light. Basically what Coraline did. But this movie was also very dark and messed up for a children's movie. The villain was a murderer, children died, and the main character was going through a form of abuse via her own parents. That's a lot to unpack for a child. But when I look back at this movie, my younger self never really recognized all of the themes of this movie. Sure, I thought it was really creepy, but I think a lot of them were probably for the older demographic that would go see the movie. To, it's it's like kind of like an episode of Spongebob where the jokes are for the adults. I have to say that this was probably one of the most terrifying and messed up films to be marketed toward children in a very long time. 
Before this movie, all we really had to contribute to child horror were the likes of Goosebumps and Are You Afraid of the Dark, which I will talk about at a different time because those are a whole other thing of things to unpack. I thank you all for listening to this different and bizarre episode of Horrifica. I want to make episodes like these more often, talking about children's horror and making connections from my past. Please give me your feedback in the comments, and if you have any children's horror that you know of that I should cover, please let me know. Tell me in the comments. Thank you all, and I'll see you next time. Until then. Hey everyone, Mercy Grim here. If you liked this episode of Horrifica, please give it a like. And if you like this channel and you're not already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button and go ahead and ring that notification bell if you want more horrific content. And I will see you all next time.